op mijn middelbare school zei ik tegen mijn uh, mentor dat ik heel graag naar de kunstacademie wilde. Die mentor zei, nee, dit, dit is voor jou niet weggelegd. Maar ik voelde mijzelf wel dat ik kunstzinnigheid wilde ontwikkelen. En toen dacht ik, ik ga het toch doen. Iemand zei laatst tegen mij, als ik jou zou mogen definiëren, zou ik bijna tegen jou zeggen dat je een materiekunstenaar bent. Ik denk dat dat wel klopt. Het werk dat ik maak bestaat eigenlijk uit natuurlijke vezels die samen eigenlijk een hele grote dansvoorstelling maken. Ik denk dat de kwaliteit van de natuur en de tinten van de, van de natuurlijkheid dat dat troost biedt. Want die natuur is, die heeft geen oordeel, die heeft geen moraliteit, die is onzijdig en die is er alleen maar. De grote gedachte eigenlijk achter het werk is vooral het laten zien van kleuren en materie die eigenlijk niet meer zichtbaar zijn in, in onze wereld. Rembrandt, Vermeer, Rubens, die maakten ook hun pigmenten met de kleuren waar ik mee verf. En alle culturen van de wereld kennen bijvoorbeeld het blauw, het typische indigo blauw. Dat wordt bijna niet meer gemaakt, verbouwd. De kennis van het maken van die indigo gaat dus ook verloren. En als we die kleuren niet meer hebben, dan is dat zo, nou, vind ik dat zo jammer, want dat zijn de kostbaarheden van onze aarde, denk ik. Kopen van verfgewassen wordt op de wereldmarkt aangeboden, maar je hebt geen clue waar het vandaan komt. Je kent die boer niet, er worden pesticiden gebruikt, dat zie je terug in de verfstof. Nou, toen dacht ik, nou, we gaan het gewoon zelf doen. En um, inmiddels is dat dus uitgegroeid tot een community van mensen, niet alleen maar studenten of stagiaires die komen en die zich voor een bepaalde tijd aan ons bedrijf verbinden, maar ook de lokale boeren. Het, uh, het is een beweging geworden. We verdienen het geld met de kunst, maar zo zou je het ook niet kunnen benoemen, want het verdienmodel zit ergens anders op. Het zit bijvoorbeeld op dat je een impact geeft aan het landschap. Het zit in een beweging, het zit in het bewustzijn, het zit in een verandering. Als ik het heb over dat het belangrijk is voor het welzijn van ons allemaal, dat maakt samen dat kunstwerk. En daar zit het verdienmodel. Het brengt heel veel werelden bij elkaar. En dat is eigenlijk best mooi. En uh, als je dat op een manier doet zoals wij dat doen, door toch heel erg serieus naar die aardekwaliteiten te kijken, dat die aarde is de enige plek waar we kunnen wonen met z'n allen. En dat je dat toch een beetje wil borgen, nou ja, dat je dat moet borgen voor, uh, voor je kinderen, dan uh, is dat mijn bijdrage. Dan heb ik dit te doen. Good morning. So you know now where you should put your money. Eh? It was why, why you laughed. <laughs> why you are laughing. It was not the meaning. <laughs> yeah, good morning. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this morning we will have a little bit different way to work on the Michael letter, but it's further the same thing. Yesterday we saw the evolution of human consciousness with different pictures, art, uh, pictures from art, and we saw how uh, the human uh, beings uh, got separated from nature, and as you ca could already see, what we are really striving now is to get a new connection on a new way with nature. So. Um, It's what we, what we are all striving for. And yesterday evening we had also a very interesting lecture to make one more step on this way. How to get a direct relationship with nature and with the spiritual aspect of nature. And um, it, I, I want to explain very shortly why we invited uh, Claudia Jungstra to come and to speak to us, because she will have the stage after my short presentation. We were in the Netherlands, uh, Uli Horter, my colleague and myself, uh, in June, and uh, we met her, she presented her work, and we were very much, much impressed, maybe three aspects. Uh, One first aspect was the, the quality of the masterpieces, the quality of uh, the light quality of the colors. 
first, first impression. Uh, we only saw small examples. Now we have big uh, master uh, work on the outside huh, with the woven skin. You could see it with the uh, uh, sunlight, how it shines so beautiful. Uh, the second aspect was very impressive, the specific work with wool, with dyeing plants and all on, from biodyna biodynamic farms and the network with a lot of local farmers and biodynamic farmers. So it was for us, for the agriculture, very important. And what I discovered a little bit after is the very strong social enga engagement for refugees, for climate questions. So it's the reason why we invited uh, Claudie to speak to us. And I have also the impression what she uh, does with uh, her team is similar to what we try to do in agriculture. It's taking, working with the nature, understanding nature, and then bring it rise up nature. In French, we have a beautiful word, I don't know in English, excuse me, élevé. It means really élevé, we rise up animals. We rise up even wine, excuse me, we are French. So, <laughs> élevé, yeah? The processing is élevé. That means get something from nature, animals, and bring them further on their way in the evolution. And I think the art is exactly the same as I understand it, to take uh, substances from nature, wool, plants, colors, and bring them together in one step further to rise up. So, Claudie Jungstra, I give you the stage. Very much welcome. Thank you very much. <coughs> I was asked to say something in Dutch, so I will for, uh, for you all. Thank you, Luel, uh, for the uitnodiging. Very grateful being here and um, telling you about my work, the philosophy. We've been working on this um, with the team for the last 25 years already. Um, as you can see, a phrase of Goethe, the eyes want to see, the hands want to caress. And I think this is something really essential in the world today. Um, do people still know how things feel. Um, and uh, I think for me it started when I uh, graduated from art school a long time ago uh, uh, doing a fashion uh, degree and working in the fast fashion industry for some years and being really not um, very, uh, I mean it didn't give me a lot of pleasure because at that time already I was very surprised that we uh, don't wear our clothes, we don't age our clothes, we just you know buy stuff and at the end of my uh, um, fashion career I had to develop eight collections a year and then there was this um, moment in my life, it happened uh, again uh, many years later when I saw something and I couldn't really place it at that time but it really struck me and it was when I saw an, um, a yurt, uh, you know a Mongolian tent or shelter in an exhibition and um, it was made from wool and I couldn't believe what I saw, I couldn't believe that people just lived in these tents and shelters for, for, uh, for centuries, they just you know, wrap it up, take it away, and then for the next place you just build it up again. And um, I just was so intrigued by wool having such an incredible quality, insulating, um, I mean there's a spectrum of this geniality of wool, um, so I quit my job uh, as a fashion designer and just uh, locked myself up in, a, in an atelier for two years, took a cleaning job in the evening and was completely uh, shut off from the world This wool was something I had to work with. But I, when I discovered um, this incredible material, I thought, okay, when I work with wool, why wouldn't I work with local sheep? And then I found out that we had this incredible breed, it's called Drenth Heat, it's the oldest breed from Northern Europe, 
uh, very distinct, uh, um, not uh, a lot of animals left because since we lost valuing wool and there's not much meat on them, um, since we lost, um, I'm being a bit rude maybe, since we lost uh, the ecological value of our land uh, because that's what these sheep are really good at, um, they, are, they disappeared. In the Netherlands we only have, uh, I mean, a handful of these sheep and um, what they really do well is that they maintain landscape in a natural way. Um, in the Netherlands, you only have 10% left of this original land where the sheep can really work well. And the impact of the food, the herbs and the small bushes and the trees, um, what, they, uh, what they graze, has impact also on the quality of wool. So uh, in the beginning, we started our own um, herd of 250 sheep, but you need uh, one hectare for one sheep a year. And the, the area where we live is, is completely dominated by monoculture. Um, artificially fertilization uh, is, is dominating the land. So the sheep get really sick. So it's very important for us to have an awareness of that. And um, uh, after 10 years, uh, it was impossible for us to have our own herd. And now we collaborate with an incredible herd in, in the northern part of the Netherlands. It's a private herd, it's a private reserve. They are uh, not uh, depending on subsidized. So this is a herd we, uh, we receive our uh, wool from. And the quality is really fantastic. Um, when people would have sheep in early days, they would just feel in their hands, uh, they could qualify with their hands the, uh, the, 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 quali the quality of the wool. And um, sometimes it's very difficult, I mean, when we have, once a year, we have all these incredible uh, uh, natural furs. Um, it goes by hand to hand and the other hand. And you can say uh, a lot of the knowledge we have in our studio is in our hands. So how do you qualify a, 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 a uh, yeah, a quality of wool just by touching it, feeling it for 20,000 hours. I mean, it takes a long time. Um, but uh, also impacting the quality of the wool is how uh, the sheep are being treated when they were sheared. Uh, in this herd, um, they do this in small groups. Uh, you can imagine if you, um, you have a very full fur for a year and then you are, uh, your wool is taking off, you are naked, it's very vulnerable. So the sheep, they go in small uh, groups of quarantine. And then uh, after some weeks, they just go into this big herd. So everything is being really taken care of with this incredible quality for um, and value for land, for 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 the for the animal, and you can say uh, the shepherd is a, a modern land manager. Um, with these fleeces, uh, we make art. Uh, the, the the local wool is our main ingredient. Uh, we use them. We use them very raw. Um, when I um, sometimes do lectures, uh, in uh, for example. People think that we really kill the animals for the wool. So I have to explain that just being sheared off, you have uh, once a year, we have this incredible fur of, of natural wool. And um, you can use that uh, in a different way. Um, so uh, very well expressed in the introduction is uh, that I learned from the very early stages that we have to brand wool as an incredible quality of a, of a natural source. So what uh, we did, because uh, already from the beginning, finding podia, working with, um, uh, for example, architects uh, with, a, with um, yeah, quite of an importance, we found, we thought it's good to find role models with Im big impact because when I started working with wool in the Netherlands, everybody was like, oh, this is very soft and anthroposophic and, uh, you know, um, I mean, it was not a trend at all. So it was very hard in the beginning to give wool that podium because the buildings were, you know, uh, very um, uh, uh, minimalistic. And the tapestry, I mean, in the Netherlands, we don't have wool tapestries in our, in our houses. It's not in our culture and it's not in our tradition. In France it is, in the, uh, in the UK it is, uh, in Scandinavia it is. But in the Netherlands, we don't have wool tapestries. So selling a wool tapestry in the Netherlands 20 years ago was really a hard thing to do. But um, wool has incredible acoustic qualities. And um, here we come in these buildings, you know, quite minimalistic, but you cannot live there, you cannot work there. So that was the left, it was my first commission in, in the Netherlands, was a ceiling, I think it was 100 square meters, 
quite a big challenge, um, but um, having a first project in the Netherlands uh, gave a lot of, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, motivation uh, to continue the work. Um, later, we had some lucky uh, moments. We did, uh, for example, uh, the, all the costumes for the Jedi warriors from Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, for some of you who know it. Um, so we had some lucky moments in the, in the early stages of, uh, of my career. On the right, you see a, a residential work in uh, New York uh, last year. So very visible is the rawness of the Drenthe heat. Um, on the right, you see uh, an installation in uh, San Francisco in the, in the MoMA, also uh, about the quality of wool, the rawness of the Drenthe heat, showing it in the museum setting. The wool is very important uh, to the work we, we uh, create, but also the soil, the earth, is also essential to what we do because it provides, it's, it's, it's the basis for our, uh, for our color palette. And in the northern part of the Netherlands, you have this really tough clay. It's very heavy, it's hard working, it's, uh, you have a lot of um, uh, resistance, so uh, you have to have this you know, uh, strong motivation, this, this um, yeah, attitude of confronting this incredible hard working land. Um, a few years ago, we bought a property um, because, as I said in, in that movie, uh, buying natural dyes in, uh, in, uh, from, the, from the world market, uh, when we would have, uh, for example, a color recipe for a certain uh, color, let's call indigo, for a year, and then we would um, make the same color with the same recipe the next year, the color difference was huge. So we found out that, for example, in processing, uh, when you harvest, uh, indigo and it's being dried, they, do it, they, they add a lot of chemicals to speed up the drying process. Uh, so there are a lot of these variables you don't know of, you have no impact on, you have no influence on. So that was the moment we thought, okay, uh, if we want to continue this work, and if you want to trace and have, um, yeah, if you want to connect yourself to the work we're doing, uh, it was very logical to start a farm. So um, I think we have the biggest little farm, uh, meaning that it has a lot of uh, layers. And in uh, five years ago, we started that, uh, that farm in the Netherlands and um, uh, uh, first sowing uh, rye to, um, to, to, uh, to help this incredible soil to be more you know, uh, loose. And, uh, and then uh, after a few years, this was transformed into this beautiful uh, garden with a glass house where we um, work also, uh, when we, when we uh, grow plants for, for farmers, we, small seeds are being developed there to small plants and then we, uh, we uh, have an incredible palette every year of dias crops. Um, this garden is, is very essential to us. Um, this is, for example, on the left, sometimes in collaborating with Vileda. Uh, we had an, a huge uh, harvest a few years with Calendula. I mean, I think the works in that year were only in, that, in these uh, pallets. And, um, but people are very often very surprised by the color pallets we make because uh, natural dyes are not in our environment anymore. Natural pellets are not in our environment anymore. There are five big uh, companies in the world, among one of them is Axel Nobel. They dominate the world of colors in our environment. So when Axel Nobel doesn't like a certain color, I mean, you don't get it, you cannot buy it, whatever. So it's, for me, it was a, was a very strange experience that um, um, people don't ever see natural pellets in our environment anymore. And um, um, two years ago, uh, we participated. Uh, the, uh, the, the Chelsea Flower Show was quite naive. We heard of it. It was this, I don't know if you are aware of the Chelsea Flower Show. This is the uh, Olympics under the botanics. So we just made a plan for a small garden. We had uh, the cheapest garden in that whole Chelsea Flower Show uh, with dias crops. And then in the whole tradition of the Chelsea Flower Show, nobody ever had designed a dias garden. And um, we won silver gilt, which means gold and then minus. Uh, but the, the reason we, we didn't win a golden medal was because we're, uh, we were debutants, we are not UK, but it was, it was super shocking for the, for the, for the visitors to, to see that garden because we had nettle in the garden. So nettle is an incredible 
plant. Um, even the, 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 the Scottish tweets, the royal tweets are dyed with nettle, but even the English didn't know of it. So I think uh, that is an example of sometimes we do these uh, impulsive um, injections into traditional worlds with uh, these kind of gardens. Uh, we copied this garden too. It's now also in the Netherlands, in the northern part where we live, we have this garden uh, in a smaller variety. One of the crops we work a lot with because the color is so intense is um, you can say the European indigo, it's called woad. Here together with students from art academies um, coming to us uh, for introduction weeks, we do whole processes, for example, from flax to yarn, from seed to plant, from plant to color. And it was a beautiful thing uh, yesterday, one of the speakers said um, the, yeah, that you uh, befreien von die Farben. It was such a beautiful sentence for me. It was like, yes, that's what it is. You just, it's like an, an alchemistic process of revealing a color hidden in a plant. And here, um, last year, uh, another incredible crop. Um, students from all over the world, they just, with bare feet, they just squeeze it. And then um, sometimes you have, uh, depending on the year, the blue is more green, sometimes it's more uh, 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 cold, etc., etc. And um, also another thing what was uh, very impactful for me when I heard it yesterday it was um, how do you perceive a color? And I know because we've been making these colors for 15 years now, um, seeing them, knowing that in certain cultures like Japan, indigo was used for medicinal reasons, in China, when we have students from China, they go to sleep and they, um, they um, cover their nails with indigo leaves and in the morning they have, they have a blue nail polish. So all these stories of all these cultures, they are embedded in that in incredible experience of indigo. And indigo is of course also a world connector because um, Euro Europe had an indigo, the world, Asia, and then uh, it also traveled to the Americas. So um, indigo is an example of a really a world connecting uh, uh, palette. So coming back to um, giving um, the incredible uh, earth qualities a stage, uh, we did that with wool and we're also doing this now with color. So, Two years ago, John Galliano from Maison Magella called us and uh, also uh, he wanted to have an incredible coat um, with indigo palette, with beautiful hand stitching. Uh, we worked on this coat six months. I mean, you cannot believe it. I mean, a wall tapestry this size, we do uh, more uh, speed up, but he was really uh, super precise and exactly he branded the, the color indigo on an incredible way. Um, another uh, important color where we work with is the madder. It's very typical uh, for the Netherlands because of the soil quality in the north, but also in, uh, in the southwest. It's, it's, a, it's a root. Uh, it takes generally five years to generate a color. So there's nobody waiting for five years for a color. Come on. Only if you say this is the color of Rembrandt, Vermeer, and um, very interesting uh, because uh, in the 17th century the Dutch, I mean, uh, our currency was madder. So we had these barns you see on the right, um, the roots uh, drying there for for two years, and then uh, extracting this insane color coming from this uh, madder root. You see it on top. I mean, it's this is not. I mean, this is just a a stupid picture of a moment when we just open up this root. I mean, the explosion of color is, is I mean, it's fire. Uh, I mean, it's incredible, I think, still. Um, so uh, we use that color uh, in exhibitions, in, in, in pieces you see uh, on top left, we, it's our dyer's lab. It's not a fancy big, you know, uh, I mean, it's just a, a lab. Uh, you, when you enter it, it's when you go back in time because also scaling up a dyer's process um, means that you cannot uh, multiply uh, a recipe because you have to take time, you have to uh, work very gradually, you have to have a good intention, you have to have a good day, um, you have to have good water. We use sometimes uh, rainwater, seawater, uh, harmonized water, flow forms. All these variables have impact on the quality of the, of the vitality of the color. On the left, a recent installation in the Rembrandt house, of course, uh, this is where the color uh, matter really has his, uh, uh, his most comfortable place. 
Um, this is a work recently installed in, uh, in New York, the Wallace Foundation. It's inspired on, uh, on, um, on the scientist um, philosophy uh, Galileo, was the first scientist who discovered the sunspots and he made this incredible aquarelles and these aquarelles uh, he made uh, had the use of showing science to a really big audience because science was very exclusive um, not, not uh, normal people had no access uh, to it and he excluded um, uh, this by showing these incredible uh, drawings to, uh, to, to the world so the matter and the indigo we have two components um, they are needed for the, the most uh, difficult natural dye to make, which is the natural black. Um, we had, uh, again, a great stage last year with the whole collection with Victor and Rolf, fashion designers, and it's called Burgundian Black. Spir spiritual glamour, they, uh, they de de decided to, to this term, and this is a color uh, research process we've been doing for the last two years with international scientists. Um, they come uh, to our biggest little farm, because when we started the farm, I mean, we just started something for us very natural. And then um, two years ago, we started the bakery in the, in the farm, because when we have groups or people coming or do educational processes, I think a good meal is part of uh, our holistic culture. So uh, an, a wood oven baked sourdough bread is something essential for us, not knowing that um, in these 15th century recipes, you, get it, you have a lot of crazy ingredients like sourdough, ashes, you have uh, waste from uh, the beer brewers because these recipes tell you how people would live together and they, I think, we're having a hard time um, uh, in the Netherlands, for example, uh, circular economy is a big thing, but um, circular economy in the 15th century was completely natural. People wouldn't throw anything away. They just would forage, go outside, they just find stuff, they had the time, they would just uh, combine strange, uh, uh, apparently strange ingredients for these recipes. So our big, biggest little farm is now a, a space, a place where uh, scientists do historical reconstructions because we have ashes, we have sourdough, we don't have waste from the beer brewers, but we have a lot. We have, uh, we have fresh crops and um, we have barks, we have you can find stuff for these recipes. So um, also very interesting is uh, when uh, these recipes are now uh, being uh, enclosed um, because they are hidden away. It's called also that they are hidden away in the so-called books of secrets um, because nobody sees them. Since we lost value of natural dyes, even for conservation, nobody's making them. And people in these uh, times, uh, 15th, 16th century, um, when they would make a dye, they would just um, wouldn't say in these recipes, for example, stir half an hour or one hour, but they would say um, three times a pater noster, uh, which is three times 12 minutes. And I gave a lecture uh, a few years ago, a f a few, last year in the US, and it was a, a guy from, uh, from the Caribbean, and he said, um, he came to me later and he said, we also use that pater noster um, uh, uh, module in cooking. So it's something, you know, very universal too. So um, this is uh, results, these are results of the experiments in the natural black. You can see the intensity, even it's difficult to photograph, but even on the left top page, you can see how dark this black is, how intense it is. It is really, you get really um, drawn into it. And um, it's referring also to, uh, to paintings uh, uh, from uh, the Netherlands and, and Belgium. A lot of the, yeah, I told you uh, about the processes of making, the processes of time. Time consuming is also uh, um, work with, with the fleeces. Uh, sometimes we do uh, pop-up labs. Uh, this is on an island in the Netherlands, one of the water islands last year. In the summer, we had a natural dye stove. We had uh, people spinning and people love to spin. I mean, uh, they're afraid of it, but in a yarn, in a, in a fiber, you can really see an identity. 
So um, you can see stress, you can see ambition, you can see anything. So um, we, uh, we do a lot of these um, trainings also with, uh, with certain groups uh, just to be in contact with the analog world. And um, education is a big part of what we do. We develop curricula for, for schools, uh, for universities, but also for, uh, for uh, more craft uh, kind of schools. For example, we will have a group of game designers in a few weeks, uh, completely shut off the tactile, haptic world. So what we do is with them, we, um, we try to open up the senses again. We try to uh, expose them to worlds and spheres and experience they never had or maybe will not have so we we find it as a yeah we, we consider it as a mission but also as a as a as a chance an opportunity to start with education carding with hand it's a lot of work too but the carding pallets um yeah there's a mix of of fibers and you can compose new uh, new tones and new diversities it's very subtle it's very uh, yeah it's 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 very sensitive it's very sensual it's um it's it's an incredible process of making hand embroidery sometimes um, an installation at restaurants after um, the felt has been made, uh, it needs some extra accents, so we do hand embroidery a lot. This is also a restaurant in New York. Um, wool is also a very healthy material. It um, purifies spaces. It's really um, something I think people are not aware of uh, enough. Recent work also in one of the buildings, uh, the former World Trade Center, uh, especially at the location as this, in a very new building um, with uh, all new materials, a very tactile wor uh, work, uh, making really contact with people, opening up dialogues, etc. Uh, residential works in the Netherlands. Um, everything we make is tailor-made. We are not a factory. We uh, work really precisely on our portfolio. We make works for relevant spaces, universities, uh, schools, Waldorf School in the Netherlands too. And uh, ha having a work in a building, we have to guarantee 40 to 60 years. And putting this work in a, in a public space, for example, um, we never had uh, that people would demolish it. We have a work in the public library in Amsterdam. Three million people come there every year. They, they can touch it. And you never see people, you know, uh, tend to, um, yeah, to, to demolish it because it, it, it breathes out, I think, respect. Um, also restaurant, edible dice. This is a restaurant uh, with a garden. Um, we, uh, we have um, started a new company since the 1st of January. It's called Extended Ground. And it, in, in the company Extended Ground, we do everything which is not wool art. So what we do is education, training, and also um, ev uh, stimulating collaborations with farmers. We do a lot of farmers' projects. For example, now in Germany, we have a project with uh, the Deutsche Sparkasse, traditional bank, not like Triodos, but incredibly open for communication and communal work. So what we do there in, uh, in Bocholt is we collaborate with local farmers, not even biodynamic, but local farmers open for transition. So we uh, develop with them um, dias crops connected to uh, local schools so that we uh, guarantee an ecological blueprint after we have made the work in that space and leaving that something really embedded in that community. This is the largest work we ever made in um, Philadelphia in, uh, in the University, Pennsylvania. 16 by 6 meters, it's a triptych. Um, we did it in three months because we have every process is in our studio. We are not depending on uh, suppliers. I mean, we can start immediately. Our team is 25 people, uh, including the farmer. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, we have strategies, we have uh, scenarios when we have a large scale project like this. Um, a work also in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia, completely embedded in architecture monochromes um, when the light changes to daylight today uh, you can see that the sphere of the of the panels that they change um, also there are acoustics and this is a really uh, beautiful collaboration working with an architect from the beginning of a project 
This is a recent work. It's in the new Triodos building uh, in the Netherlands, in Zeist, with uh, the architect Thomas Rau. The whole building is modular, so if you want to break it down, it's possible. I mean, it's, it's a very uh, interesting philosophy of Thomas. This is a work also with uh, only wool and a natural palette, and we installed it in, uh, in autumn, and it's really connotated with the environment. Natural yeah, tapestries, uh, they always harmonize. You never have that you think, oh yeah, they don't fit with the furniture or whatever people are sometimes afraid of, but they just go in the building and just be there. Um, so, the work uh, outside, uh, woven skin, in 2014 already, um, being aware of this uh, mondial crisis, climate, uh, uh, heritage, uh, um, I was thinking uh, to develop a sculpture uh, uh, with a world tour, and then the idea behind it is to connect worlds, uh, to open up uh, discussions, panel discussions, and uh, maybe uh, having impact on, 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 a, on an awareness, uh, how we can uh, relate ourselves to, to men, to, to the world, to, uh, uh, and to, uh, yeah, to, to layers we are not uh, connected with. It was too easy I th uh, for me uh, to think, I mean, I make a very um, you know, aesthetic work because that's what we do all the time in places, but this is a work meaning to provoke and um, it's called woven skin. Skin, can, you can say, it's a, it's, it's a shelter. Um, people uh, have different uh, associations, very much related to culture. For example, when it was in Palermo, uh, people responded to the work with their hearts, in the Netherlands with the, with the head. They were really shocked, but the Italians not. Um, it's very interesting, wherever we go with woven skin, we have different responses. So it was part of uh, also uh, Climate Week last year in, uh, in New York. We had a panel discussion uh, with prominent speakers. And um, uh, after this tour, it's been touring for two years now. In September, it will has, uh, have its final destination in Museum de Lakenhal in Leiden. A museum with a big tradition with uh, woolen fabrics, qualifying wool in the 17th century. and. Um, then it um, is the end of, uh, of this tour and hopefully we will have engaged a lot of people and then um, I think then the mission was completed.